It's time for Washington Sidefish Quest. Planning an Alaskan saltwater fishing trip. Oh, hello there. I didn't see me start filming. I uh, was just looking over pictures from my 2008 trip to Alaska. You know, uh, when I started saving for that trip, I worked at Target and, uh, you know, made just about minimum wage. It took me three years. I set aside $50 a month during that time. And uh, for a long time, and maybe still, it was a defining kind of moment of my life because I always wanted to go to Alaska since I was a little kid. And I ended up going up to catch a can for five days. It was one day, there was an arrival day, a guided day, two self days just on a boat in the salt water, you know, just with me and my, actually ended up being my friend's dad, and then uh, a go home day. So it was uh, a five day trip with travel days, only three days of fishing. But on that trip, I just had a wonderful time, trip of a lifetime. I caught my uh, all time personal best pink, I caught my personal best coho, and I caught my biggest fish I've ever caught, which was a 116 pound Pacific halibut. The pink and the coho have fallen by bigger fish in Washington waters a few times over now. But that 116 pound halibut, I don't think that's going to uh, go anywhere anytime soon as far as my personal biggest fish. At any rate, it was a trip of a lifetime and it's been 13 years since I've been back there. And a buddy of mine from work asked, uh, you know, we were talking last year and he said, yeah, I'd like to go to Alaska. So we planned a trip and I'm just about to leave in 30 minutes. The purpose of this video is to help you plan for your own Alaska trip. Throughout the video, you'll see nickel saver tips. So first nickel saver tip is to start planning early. So that might not sound like it's actually gonna save you money, but it's fun and it does save you money. Cause so here's, here's basically the different things I would plan for. And there's a few of these things that if you give yourself a nice big long window, you can find deals. So uh, flights is a good one because uh, airlines have sales at different times throughout the year. So, you know, if you decide that you want to go next month, then you're kind of stuck with the rates at that time. However, if you, you know, you give yourself eight, nine months, then there will be deals during that time. Another thing is in our case, uh, my buddy wanted to go, uh, we're going three days again, but it's fully guided. We're basically going out in charters, sort of like Westport style out of Seward. Uh, he just basically wanted to make sure he came home with a bunch of halibut. I personally am more of a self-guided type of person. I usually like to, that last trip I took, I took a guide the first day just to kind of get the ropes, you know, and then the second, so the second two days tried to replicate and I get more joy that way personally. But I wasn't, you know, I, I'm, I'm totally fine coming home with Halibut and honestly, it's just about getting, getting out of the state and, you know, having an adventure. At any rate, uh, the guides uh, that we're going out with the boats, uh, if you send them a check, they take 2% off of your total bill. So I just mailed them a check, you know, because I had plenty of time. So that's another way you can get savings. And then another way is going off season. So I'm going, you know, this is the middle of June. And the reason is, I think it's June 17th, and then it hits peak season. And it costs, I think, about $100 more a day to go. And since halibut's the goal, opposed to salmon, uh, that is, uh, you know, who, we don't really care about peak season. We just want to get halibut. And we will jig for kings. It's, it's a, it's a multi-species uh, charter. Unlikely we'll get any, but still, I mean, if, you know, that's another thing to take into account if you need to go during peak season or not. Then maybe the biggest nick nickel saver of all, as far as your real world finances go, is I don't know if, how many of you are old enough to remember going to Kmart and you, you know, you put the, you put the Sega Genesis on the layaway or you put your, a nice pair of pants on the layaway. So, you know, if you plan the trip well in advance and you're piecing things out as you pay for them, it's like, it barely hurts. It's, uh, you know, so I paid, we played for, for the plane fare six months ago. You know, we played for pay for the charter even before then, maybe like eight months ago. Uh, we pay for the hotels when we get there. Uh, we paid for the rent a car maybe three months ago because we need to drive from Anchorage to Seward to get to the fishing. You're absorbing more like $500 every now and again versus like $2,500 all at once. And that's a huge, at least for me, a huge deal. So there you go, that's, that's my, that's my pre-tips. Now let's get going. So head off to meet my buddy. Here's a big nickel saver tip. Do not pay for a shuttle to the airport. I mean, you've got some friends, right? Or at least a minute me so you a favor. So go ahead and call those in and get them to drive you to and from. That'll save you some cash. In this case, my uh, buddy's daughter is going to uh, drive us there and back. I didn't even have to beg. I mean, I guess we'll see. 
uh, I'll, you know, I mean, you know, have some gas money on you, but still way cheaper than taking the shuttle or whatever. All right, we're about to board here on our trip to Anchorage to go down to Seward. So here's another nickel saver tip. Do not check a bag. So this is all, all I got. So in there I got my rain gear, uh, my long underwear, changes of underwear, changes of socks, National Park Pass, Seasick Pass, patch, uh, you know, my toiletries. And I think that's dang near it. You know, I guess my phone charger, stuff like that. But uh, the reason you do that, checking bags cost money, but hopefully you'll have fish to bring back on the flight. So that can save you quite a bit of money uh, checking it on the flight instead of getting it mailed. Well, here we are, landed safely in Anchorage. So far as I can tell, uh, it's just some kind of airport to the entire city. Hey, it turns out there's more than just an airport here in Anchorage. It's a big, huge city. It's my understanding Alaska is also a fairly sized state. Haha. <laughs> now, of course, it's the biggest state. At any rate, I am out here. Uh, it might look like it's about evening, but it's actually just before midnight right now. Peter and I went and grabbed, uh, the buddy I'm here with, went and grabbed some pizza. Uh, you know, at a place that everybody told me I had to try, and it was very good. Of course, I had some reindeer on it, being from out of town and everything. Uh, so at any rate, I don't know if I covered at the front of the video because I was on my way out the door to go to the airport, what the itinerary was. So uh, day one, travel day, uh, to, you know, from SeaTac to Anchorage. Day two, you have to drive two and a half hours from Anchorage to Seward. You either have to, you know, drive in a car or take the train, but we're just, you know, we did a dinner rent a car. And as far as a nickel saver trip, I mean, you can you can think of either if you if you need to do that. So when I went to Ketchikan, uh, the hotel just picked you up, you know, from the airport, and that was a huge cost savings. But we kind of factored it in for this this trip to get back to the itinerary. Uh, so on Wednesday, apparently you can't fish for halibut, which is our target. So we just figured we were just going to take a leisurely day and maybe, you know, we're going to go see Exit Glacier, uh, which is a national park. And as another nickel saver, I brought my national park pass. So just remember that if you have a national park pass for, you know, the lower 48, it's good in Alaska. So, you know, save yourself however much it would be to enter the national park by bringing your national park uh, pass. So at any rate, uh, it is, you know, so on Tuesday we left, travel day, air, you know, airport day. Wednesday, like car travel day, just to get to Seward. And then fishing Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And then we are coming back Sunday. So six day trip, three days of fishing. One day just kind of enjoying and, and traveling and seeing the sights. So the fishing charter, just so you know, is uh, where it's just kind of like Westport style charters. We're just going out on a charter boat, uh, 12, 12 person boat the first two days and a six pack charter the final day. Uh, halibut is the goal, it's two a day is the limit. One is a very small slot limit, 28 and under. I don't know if I've actually ever caught a halibut that small. <laughs> you know, I think that's even smaller than like a 15 pounder. That's a pretty small halibut, could be wrong. But, and then the other one's a halibut of any size. So that's the money halibut. You know, hopefully Peter and, I, Peter and I get in some 40, 50, maybe 60 pounders in that range. That would really make a, a good uh, kind of meat savings for the trip. And then uh, it's a combo charter. So then we get rockfish, which I think the limit's four. Yeah, one can be non, non-pelagic, non meaning like a yellow eye or canary. And then uh, then we jig for king salmon, if, if there's any time left. It's a 12-hour trip, but or 12-hour uh, charter, but it's my understanding it takes two hours probably to get to where you're going and two hours back. So you're probably in the water for more like eight hours. So there you go. That's the plan. Hopefully I can get you some scenic footage here on the drive from Anchorage to Seward. Oh, you know, and as I walk back to the room, too, it occurs to me I forgot with my, my nickel saver tips. Uh, so my bag's very packed, and you might think, Blake, you can't get any souvenirs in that bag. Well, I kind of give my old loved sh beloved shirts Viking funerals in this way, you know, when I go on a trip like this where you only have so much bag space. So I have a few t-shirts in there, uh, you know, that I've worn through the years, and they're full of holes and falling apart, and that's what I'll wear fishing. You know, I have, of course, I'll have long underwear and stuff, too, but I'll just wear those shirts one time, and then... Like I say, I give them that, that shirt viking funeral, uh, wadding them up and putting them into garbage cans in exotic lands, thanking them for their 15 years of service.
All right, well, here we are at Exit Glacier State Park. We've arrived. You know, we're not quite in Seward yet. This is right before Seward. Better get our glacier viewing in while that's still a thing you can do. <laughs> so, yeah, like I said, brought my National Park Pass, nickel saver tip there. Uh, I'm not sure if we need it or not, but it is a national park, so here we go. Oh, yeah. Yeah. What a shot. So right behind me there, and if you can see it, yeah, right there. That's the exit, exit glacier. It is beautiful. I don't know if it's coming through on the camera or not, but it has these, uh, like, turquoise blues. Maybe that's not the right word. What's the word for blues? Is it turquoise? I don't know. It's got a blue that looks like, you know, it's from a swimming pool. <laughs> beautiful. At any rate. Wait. Marine? Marine. Yeah, aquamarine. That's the word. Not turquoise. Aquamarine. It's got these aquamarine blues that are just gorgeous. So Peter and I have walked by a bunch of signs with dates on them like this, and I'm so slow I didn't occur to me what they are until now. These are where, this is where the glacier used to be. Now we are like a long way away from the glacier. We're going up to the glacier overlook now, and it's half a mile away. So it was at least half a mile, <laughs> you know, bigger. And we've seen signs out there like in the 50s and stuff. So yeesh. I mean, this, it's kind of super depressing, although it's also breathtakingly beautiful. Uh, but oof. I mean, I was joking about it receding before, but uh, yeah, definitely kind of a kick to the heart. <laughs> All right, we just crossed that little stream there. Uh, we heard the ranger telling another group that there is a mama black bear up here and to make lots of noise and let her know you're coming and all that good stuff. So hopefully we don't encounter her, but definitely adds a little excitement to the trip. All right, wow, this is beautiful here behind me. Look at that. This is uh, this is uh, the first time in the trip I've been honestly like really Jones. You know, I'm super excited. It's beautiful view. Um, if I'm being totally honest, like a lot of the trip, I'm just being like, oh, Washington has this and, uh, you know, as well, you know. <laughs> but, I mean, this is like a view that, you know, you'd travel for, you know, and just the feel of being up here. I mean, that is just beautiful landscape there, minus my face. Here, I'll get out of the way. <laughs> well, we made it. Check this out behind me here. There it is. Exit Glacier. Isn't it beautiful, folks? It's uh, really something to be next to, I'll tell you that. They really don't feel, I mean, I know it's not sediment, but... It really does feel alive. You know, I guess that is partially true with microorganisms and that sort of thing. But yeah, just totally different feel than just like snow on a mountain. It's uh, really quite rejuvenating, I guess, breathtaking, renewing, just being up here. Uh, and then to, you know, make everybody really bummed out, down here you can see where those folks are standing down there, where the glacier was in 2005. So it's when all the, it's retreated all that way. Look at that. That is such a big retreat in only 16 years. That's crazy. That sucks. Uh, but thankful for uh, being here now. We just got our lunches from the Safeway, and earlier we uh, went and had some really overpriced uh, clams and fish and chips, respectively. But that said, Seward's a great little town. Uh, the charter company you're growing with has been awesome. They were uh, really, really nice when we checked in. I don't know. Maybe we're going to go on a little walk or something. Maybe go look at the boat, something like that, then call it in the early night and get up at, uh, I don't know, 4.30 be at the boat by 5.40 and then we're off. Well, if you've watched this far and now you're excited for some awesome Alaskan fishing footage, I must apologize. Uh, this is going to be a mix of pretty lousy footage and photos. I got, I was out for three days and I got seasick as a dog the first day. I do kind of suffer from the curse of seasickness, you know, and I've tried everything. I always stay busy when I'm on the boat. I stay out of the cabin. I have the patch on. Just some people just have it, you know, and that's just part, part of my uh, equilibrium, I suppose. The only thing that that really works for me is just getting my sea legs, but that usually takes me about a full three days to accomplish, and then after that I'm fine. So unless I'm on a very long ocean trip, I usually just have to fight through it and accept the fact that I'm going to, you know, feel lousy when I'm fishing. But I do fish, and I do stay busy, you know. I mean, you pay a lot to be out there. Uh, so at any rate, I, you know, we left at 5 in the morning. First, you have to get out of Resurrection Bay, which is about a half an hour trip, and Resurrection Bay is very protected by mountains, very beautiful setting. Uh, yeah, just picturesque. You'd think it was almost tropical if you didn't know where you were uh, and you didn't, you know, know, know what kinds of trees there were and stuff, I suppose. Then as soon as you leave it, then you see what you're actually in for. And we, it was very big swell on that first day, you know, pretty bad wind chop. And then we ran 40 to 50 miles out to what was called Montague Island. And it was, we were going probably about half speed, but it was like every 10 seconds was just like, bump, psh, 
bump, psh, your, your butt's actually pretty sore by the time you get out there. And I wasn't the only person sick on the boat, by the way. Anybody who, who like, even mildly gets seasick uh, got it pretty good. But uh, fishing was also quite slow that first day. So I think I caught the first halibut of the day, and then it was about, and it was a, just a, a chicken, you know, there's the limits too. And as I said incorrectly at the beginning of the video, I said 28, 28 inches. It's actually when it was to be under 32. So I got my under 32, like right away, like first on the boat. And then it was six hours between uh, my second one. <laughs> and, you know, I, I probably threw up, you know, in that six hour span at least once an hour, you know, or dry heaved or whatever. But uh, the last one of the day, as you can see here, I'm jigging. So we're only in 60 feet of water. We're anchored, which is pretty dang cool. And I'm sitting there jigging just this huge white grub. And it was actually a pretty, pretty successful way to get to get halibut for people on the boat. Uh, in my case, it did take quite a while. And unfortunately, I had uh, came to the conclusion that my, my head camera was bad luck, you know, and I was pretty cranky by that point. So I, I took it off and put it in my pocket. And then about five minutes later, I caught my last fish of the day. And, you know, it was nothing to brag about. It was, it was over the slot limit of 32 inches, but not by much. You know, it was an eater, I'd call it. You know, chicken, really. Uh, but, you know, I got, got the two halibut. And then we, uh, went, we went and got our four rockfish limit, our four black rockfish on the way back. And it was a good trip. It was a good day. But, you know, obviously not what we were hoping for as far as just like an amazing Alaskan trip. But, the, but you know, the captain and crew, they did the, you know, that there was two deckhands. They did their job on the 12-pack charter. Now, here's where we took a divergence in the trip. And uh, sorry if you think less of me for this. But my the buddy I was with, who, who generally doesn't get too seasick, he also got extremely seasick. So we uh, canceled the second day. We just it was just supposed to be worse. It wasn't even clear if the boats were going to go out or not. So we were just like, ah, even if they do go out, it's going to be terrible. And it sounds like by all by all accounts, it, it was. <laughs> but I, th I do think the boats did go out. We did, but when we just came back, we just said, hey, you know, find someone to fill our seats if you can. And so that second day, and I, I participated in. It's the Resurrection uh, River uh, sockeye fishery, and really it's a bay. So uh, I'm sorry if folks think less of me for this, but it is a floss slash snake fishery. And in Alaska, that's perfectly illegal. Wait, no, I said that wrong. It's perfectly legal. <laughs> it's perfectly legal, I tell you. Uh, so it's, uh, you know, the limit's six a day for sockeye. And in Alaska, any fish in salt water, you can snag or floss or basically get it in the boat any means possible. It's uh, not not at all like in Washington, where there's like any kind of ambiguity around, you know, when people go to a floss fishery. Yeah, they got the fish on the head, but it didn't bite. In Alaska, it's just understood. If you're in the salt, at least, you know, if you, you know, you can floss a fish, snag a fish, do whatever. So the first day, I actually kind of was like, huh, I'm from Washington. Like, what a... What an unethical thing to do. Then the second day, you know, we're just sitting there. You know, we went out and we had some delicious, uh, there's a lady there that makes really good crepes. But at any rate, we're sitting there. The tide's coming up. It'd be the perfect time to go target them. So we just couldn't resist running a pole and, and you know, running some waders and going down there and participating. Uh, from, my, from my perspective, no regrets. It uh, it was great. We got, got five sockeye, as you can see here. And it was absolutely the most Alaskan thing I did during the trip. It was, uh, you know, like a lot of people on our vacation, you want like experiences you can remember. And it was, it was honestly a great time. It, it was combat fishing, but it was super, everybody was super nice. You know, most of the people were locals, like really welcoming. Uh, yeah, like I said, no, no regrets on my end. I, I totally had a, good, a great time and sockeye might be my favorite salmon. So uh, that was a, another big piece of it, as you can see from this filet here. Uh, yeah, like I say, no regrets. So then day three. Uh, you know, we went, so that was the, our final day, you know, we got up both kind of fearing going out. It was supposed to be as rough, rough weather as day two, but we weren't going to skip two days in a row. Cause that'd just be, you know, downright, uh, cowardly. <laughs> so we go out for the third day, we're heading out of the bay and you know, the ships follow, the boats follow each other and we're on a six pack this day. Uh, so to cut down on the, you know, just the wave chop because it is so rough. I mean, sometimes you're going like straight up and then straight down, you know, and, uh, the, the, the lead boat, as soon as it exits the bay, goes, I can't believe this. Like, you got to turn around, you know. And, uh, and then the, the, my, my captain was like, what? You know, and, and as soon as we got out there, it was just like, it looked like Puget Sound. It was beautiful. So I didn't really have, uh, I, I filmed some stuff on my cell phone for going out, but I, I was not prepared because I thought it was uh, just going to be another a hellacious day, frankly, on the water. But it was a wonderful day. Uh, the fishing was way, way better. We got to the same spot, but... 
uh, almost the same spot. We were out kind of on the, out in that same area around Montague Island, but it was uh, like I said, the fishing was just much improved. Uh, I you know I got my again. I think I think at both days I got the first halibut and then the last, and they basically you basically got to sit there and wait for the last guy. So. Uh, first halibut, you know, I got, it was right under the slot limit again. If it was like 32 inch slot limit, they actually netted it and they measured it and they're like, oh, it's just under. And then I, I lucked out with last halibut of the day. Uh, it, and there was kind of a guy that didn't understand that that was my fish since I was the only one who needed one. So he started to, he almost jerked, which in Alaska, that means it's his fish and you kind of, they just have to release it. And I, I was kind of proud of myself. I sort of chased him off and was like, Hey, that, that's my fish. Get out of here. <laughs> because he just didn't understand, I guess that that's what we were waiting for. And, uh, yeah, the, you know, I just, it, it was, we were using a sock I had for bait and then my rod just doubles over, you know, and I knew it was a big fish and, and it was about the perfect size. To, to me, the perfect size halibut you want to catch, especially after catching a 116-pounder in Alaska, is about a 55-pounder because that's sort of when they're at their peak of size and flavor. This halibut was in the 60-pound class, and having had some now, I think I'm going to readjust that to a 60-pound class is just fine because it tastes great. <laughs> you know, that 116, if I had to do over again, I would have released that fish. Uh, even at the time when I was in my 20s, uh, I, I knew that I, that uh, that was a big female, and while I was sitting there deliberating, the, the captain came and put a shell in its head, so, uh, you know, the end of deliberation there. But uh, at any rate, you know, the bigger they get, the less, less good they taste. But yeah, this fish was in the 60-pound class, and it tasted just wonderfully. So then we went to get a rockfish, and you can keep up to one yellow eye each. And this is kind of a trigger warning when I show you uh, some of these yellow eye, because uh, if you know your fish... Uh, you know biology you'll know some of these guys might have been born in like the late 1800s so this one i'm holding here was not one i caught but it was caught on our boat and as you as you, you know that fish is like well over 100 years old so it's kind of sad but you know at the same time i do like yellow eye and uh i, I caught one that was smaller than that and uh, was ha very happy to have it because i get to eat them maybe once every you know 13 years when i go to alaska because they've been closed in washington for about 25 years so at any rate, we got our yellow eye, we got, then we got our three black rockfish to polish off our rockfish limit, and then we trolled for salmon, king salmon, we just used deep six divers, you know, just uh, like old school, and uh, just had, uh, they, were, they were spoons, I'm not sure what brand, I mean they look kind of like kingfisher spoons, and on flashers, uh, or, or dodgers, there was a mix of both, so, the, so we were anywhere from probably 25 to 40 feet down, depending on the deep six you were using. Uh, we, the prospects weren't good for salmon. Uh, apparently, no one had no boat had brought in more than three or four. Well, we we ended up really uh, lucking out, and we uh, limited the whole boat limited, and even the the captain and uh, the deckhand got one too. So that was great, uh, and I I was really kind of happy because uh, you know I kind of rebounded for my first day, and uh, when we when we were out of stop because two people had them on, you know, and they're fighting them in the back and you just kind of take turns. I grabbed a jigging rod. There was one jigging rod up front and just dropped it. And about uh, 25 feet down, the, the salmon just nailed the jig. So that's how I got one of my one of my kings was uh, by doing that. And I was pretty happy with that since it was kind of an autonomous action. Uh, the salmon for me that I got weren't huge. They were, they were like regular, kind of like 10 pound class. But we did have some definitely upper teens come in. I tell you, it's really wild fishing for king salmon with barbed hooks, and uh, they're wild. <laughs> and just being able to throw them in the boat like they're trout, pretty much. So here we are back at the back of the dock, and as you can see, they're, they're ratcheting the fish up there. Our, our captain, our, our first uh, first mate there, had a really good eye for decoration. And this, this day was everything you dream about when you go to Alaska. This was absolutely made the trip for me. Uh, it's the day I'll remember for another 13 years until I get back up there again. Uh, you know, we got a, a picture with the whole, uh, all yeah, six cool. people on the boat. Ooh. And th that's one thing about charter fishing too, is, uh, you know, yeah, the captain puts you on the fish, but, but each trip is really different. And I would say we were operating pretty well, you know, as a unit, the people on the boat, like we wanted to help be helpful, you know, and like reel up the rods and, and do that sort of thing. And the, you know, the captain basically led us to as much as he felt comfortable with. So I did feel a camaraderie with, with the guys, but at any rate, here's just a picture of me and the fellow I was up there with Peter, uh, you know, with the fish behind us. And like I said, uh, probably best charter trip of my life. So there you go. That was the, the fishing recap. All right, well, thanks for sticking it all the way through the video. 
So some people requested uh, when I did a poll about whether or not to do this video to actually kind of get my breakdown of prices, so I'll give that to you now. Before I do, you know, since I didn't get the greatest footage on the boat or just kind of driving around in general, uh, the wildlife we saw is as follows. When we were on the boat, we probably saw about five or six whales a day. We saw porpoises. Uh, we saw actually mountain goats from the boat, uh, like which is kind of neat. And we also saw mountain goats in the car. My buddy I was with, he said it was on his bucket list to see a moose in the wild, just in general, bucket list item for him. Kept our eyes peeled the whole trip, did not see one until we were driving back through Anchorage and there's this kind of greenway there. We were probably five miles from the airport and this uh, big field male moose uh, just runs right by, right by the side of the freeway into this greenway and my buddy goes, it's a moose, and we looked. and So that was awesome, uh, just to see that. So really, really was a great way to end the trip. Okay, so let's see here. So I'm going to go over the costs, and I'll let you know if I think there's a way to do this any cheaper, and then I'll give you the total costs when I get to the end. So the flight was about two fifty. Oh, oh, and by the way, all these costs are split in two. So if you're going solo, you'd have to double this. So really, the way to do it is you got to find someone to go with to, to split those costs, and then just usually one person pays for it, and the other person writes them a check for half. So first is the flight. It was about two fifty-five each. Uh, so that might seem kind of cheap, but that's for two reasons. One, it's still the off season a bit in, in you know early to mid June, and two, I have a credit card which bears the name of a uh, airline that flies to the state, or you know bears the name of the state. You know, I, I never like to shill on my channel if you if you've watched me, you know. So you know what I'm talking about. But I want to give them the free pre free credit, <laughs> free press. Uh, so with that credit card, I get a uh, every year a ninety nine dollar companion fare. I also get uh, enough airline miles that sometimes I could just go for free, but I used that in uh, 2018 going to uh, Philadelphia. I got to fly there back and free on that same credit card just from racking up airline miles. But at any rate, that's why it might seem kind of cheap at 255 is uh, because I have that companion fare for 99 So we paid a full full one-way, uh, or, or full two-way, I mean, round trip. And then, then uh, we had that $99 companion fare, then just split the overall cost. Uh, so that'll help you keep the cost down. Lodging was $300. Uh, so it was basically 600 each for six nights, and so basically it, it is expensive to stay in Alaska. So one thing you could really do to bring the cost down, actually there's two, you could either camp or get like a camper van. Now that would dramatically drop your cost down and combine it with the rental car cost. Uh, however, $200 a night in Seward is not a bad price at all, and even though I just said I wasn't going to shill, uh, there, where we stayed was a place called Exit Glacier Lodge that's just outside of town, and they treated us super good. Very basic rooms, but super clean. Uh, you know, the TVs are really small, but you're not, you're not there to watch TV. You're there to fish, and uh, I would I'd highly recommend them. And if I ever if I ever go again, I'm going to stay at Exit Glacier Inn. And they did not, you know, obviously pay me to say that. Or no, I'm doing a YouTube video that will reach dozens of people. <laughs> so let's see here. Uh, rental car. I think it was about 275. My my buddy got the rental car and I paid him half, so I'm a little fuzzy on that. But I think it was somewhere in that range. It wasn't quite a hundred dollars a day. Uh, we just got a small small one. Uh, I think it was ended up being a hybrid. I, I told him to get the insurance. I actually don't know if he did or not. Uh, gas uh, fifty dollars each. You know, so about a hundred dollars to keep that tank full there and back, and you have to return it to a full tank. Uh, charter boat that was the big one. It went about uh, one thousand dollars. It was like one thousand twenty-five dollars right in there for three days of guided charter boat fishing. So that's the that's the more, most expensive. I was saying that to someone though when they asked me how much it costs a day, and I was like, well, it was about three twenty-five, you know, plus tax. And the person pointed out to me he goes, well, I go tuna fishing, and that's like five hundred dollars, you know, uh, a trip. So I was like, oh, that's true. You go out there and get two halibut, four rockfish, and two king salmon if you're lucky. So still not a bad bad price for a charter because. Uh, they go far. I mean, it's uh, like I said, half an hour to get out of the bay, then another 40 uh, miles to get to that island. So it's a long, long uh, trek. Uh, so in the trip I went to in 2008, I did self-rented boats where you're just on a, uh, I was just on a 14-foot skiff, but you can rent bigger boats. So that's a way to get that price down if you want. Uh, then tips, I put tips for the, the deckhands on there. So I just have $100 as a placeholder. I usually do 40, 40 a day, uh, sometimes 30. It depends how much I have on me. Uh, fish processing, so it was about 150 each, so that's about 300 total to process the fish we caught, uh, and that is flaying, uh, vacuum sealing, and freezing it, and then putting it into those 50-pound boxes to ship it back. 
Now the beauty of that is then they can be your check on luggage as I said earlier in the video. So you don't have to uh, pay an absorbent uh, overnight mail cost. Uh, so yeah, we got about, uh, we had ended up with three boxes and those are 50 pound boxes. They don't quite have uh, 50 in it. They have more like 40 to 45. So, you know, we brought home about 100, between 135 and 140 pounds of fillets of delicious halibut and sockeye and king salmon and rockfish, including yellow eyes. So, whew, and most of it was halibut though, to be clear, like more than half easy. So, uh, yeah, I can't beat that. Uh, let's see here. So the for so for the to get it home on the flight, I don't know if this is because I have the credit card or if it's because you can check your first bag free if you're flying from Alaska. But we both got to check one of those 50 pound bags for free. I mean, usually these days the airlines rip you off and make you pay for any checked luggage. So I was really surprised that it was zero dollars for the first two 50 pound boxes. Then the third one was just forty dollars because it counted as one of our second bags. So to to get 150 pounds, you know, uh, if you include like the you know the cooler, the the, the insulation stuff, home, it was it was only forty bucks. So that was great. Uh, licenses were fifty five each. So a three-day Alaska sport fishing license, I think, is only like 25 bucks, but then they have what's called the King Salmon Stamp, which I believe is 30. So that more than doubles the price. You know, the first two days, we're like, oh, what, what a couple of fools we are to get the King Salmon Stamp, but whew, are we glad we got it after that third day. Uh, then for food, I just put 200 bucks in there. I don't know what I spent on food. I uh, We really would just have like kind of like one extravagant meal a, a day and then eat like Pop-Tarts in the morning, stuff like that. But then go to have a nice dinner. Go spend 40 bucks on dinner. You know, I had elk steak one night. That was really cool. Ate a lot of reindeer. Uh, when I was in Anchorage, they actually have uh, reindeer sausage vendors. And uh, it's good. I like reindeer actually quite a bit. Uh, then I did not include souvenirs. That's up to you. A, a lot of people, like my uh, my mother and father-in-law, I just brought them back fish, you know. <laughs> so I did get my wife a, a necklace, which ran me quite a bit. But uh, I'm not going to include the price here because I'm a classy guy. So at any rate, that all came to... Uh, 2750 bucks. So that was a little more than I would have liked to spend. I think my my ceiling was like 2500. So I went a little over. Uh, you know, I actually put in the amount that I spent into uh, the, my Ketchikan trip in 2008, which was 2 grand and uh, did a inflation calculator and that came out to $2500 in today's uh, you know, dollars and that's kind of what I was going off of. Uh, that said, you could get it down to much closer to two two grand. Uh, you know, kind of sort of three big things. You know, one's the fishing itself. So if you didn't go with a guide all three days, uh, which in Seward's kind of impossible because it's just such big water. But in, the, in other places in Alaska, certainly you can go self guided. That's a biggie. Uh, you know, just rent a boat. Then the, I'd say the next thing is lodging. Uh, that is kind of tough unless you do want to stay in a camper van or a tent, but that's probably what I'm going to try next time. I think I might try a camper van, uh, you know, maybe try a river trip. And then third would be transportation. So I didn't know the train ran from Anchorage to Seward. That might have been a cool thing to try. Uh, but also, uh, like I said, just depending on where you go, there, there are some kind of like packages you can get where whoever the, the charter is or the hotel will actually, you know, transport you. And again, going two and a half hours from Anchors to Seward, probably not really an option, but if you're going to go to Alaska, you can probably get that, that, that cost and still have like a pretty fabulous trip down more to like two grand. Uh, so there you go. Well, thank you so much for watching. I hope that was somewhat uh, informational for you. And I hope you'll uh, watch my videos this summer. I think I'm going to have quite a busy time on the channel here. I've got some in the can actually already. So thank you so much. And uh, see you next time on Washington Fish Quest.